Welcome to the last installment of the lecture Optimization Methods for Machine Learning and Engineering. Today we will open the scope a little bit uh, to the end of this lecture series and today we will hear about gradient-free and non-convex optimization, so things that have not been covered in the previous lectures and uh, this will open up the scope a little bit more, but we will not go into every detail. This is uh, to give you a taste of what is uh, to, to be found beyond the scope of the lecture. We will talk about optimization of non-convex continuous functions. We will learn about mixed integer optimization, where, for example, we have only integers or natural numbers in the solution. Uh, we will hear about stochastic optimization and there will be a quick recap and outlook. So, let's dive into non-convex continuous objective functions. So far, all the optimization problems we considered have been convex and we had a lot of advantages from that. We could always, quote-unquote, walk downhill. And also, we were sure that there is only a global optimum that fulfills some conditions. For example, for unconstrained optimization, that the gradient is zero at only this point. Now, for non-convex optimizations, we cannot rely on all this prior knowledge. Um, and so we need to have other concepts to, to think about these kinds of functions. And uh, one very important of these concepts is the uh, Lipschitz continuity. So we call a function Lipschitz continuous if, it is, uh, if, if there is a certain limit to how much this function is, is bending. Yeah? So here we look at uh, two values in the, in the domain of the function. And uh, now, if the distance between this function has a, so, uh, between the two points is, is limited, then also we know that the, the distance of the function evaluated at uh, these two points is, is limited. And uh, so, if we have a function that is has only a very small bendiness. Uh, then, the, then there can be a very small Lipschitz constant and another function that is bending quite a lot. Uh, here the, the Lipschitz constant uh, would be larger uh, because I could pick here some points that are pretty close uh, to one another but where the distance between the points uh, evaluated on the function is quite large. Okay. So, um, for the Lipschitz continuity, uh, well, this is the definition. It, it should say everything there is to know about, about Lipschitz continuity. And now assume that we have a non-convex function at hand. Uh, so now our f is uh, Lipschitz continuous but non-convex. And we try to optimize it and we try to find a solution that is closer to the optimizer than some very small epsilon. Okay. So the remaining error that we allow is this epsilon. And uh, the question is, how often would we have to evaluate f if we did a grid search to be sure that our solution is uh, uh, smaller than this epsilon away from the optimizer? Okay. And now we can make a very simple um, well, example, example problem out of that. Let's say uh, we have a function that is completely flat and has only a small dip or dimple and, and, um, and we try to find that. So in uh, drawn as a 3D figure, now here in 2D, let's say here we have our 2D, we have our function and we somehow plot a grid on that and there is only one, one place where this function has a small dip. Where here it, it goes down and up again, and then of course here in, in, in 3D, so there, there's a dip that goes down just epsilon. And, and the question is, how, how, um, how 
more fine-grained. We need to make our grid search in order to find this dip. And uh, this has uh, a quite dramatic growth in its runtime complexity because in higher dimensions, so when we are not in, in 2D but in ND, then for this grid space we would need L, so this has to be a small L because this is the Lipschitz constant, constant divided by 2 epsilon and then we round that down and the whole thing is taken to the power of n. Uh, that many evaluations of the, of the grid are required to be sure that we have uh, found uh, a solution that is no, not farther than this epsilon away from, uh, from, 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 from the minimizer. And what you see here is now when we make this epsilon smaller, we have to dramatically increase the, the number of evaluations that we need. And also if we make the L bigger, so if there is a more bendiness of the function, then we also have to dramatically make the, the, the number of evaluations bigger. And I'll consider a very simple optimization problem in 16 dimensions. So we have, we have solved much more complicated optimization problems than that for convex optimization problems. But now for the non-convex one, assume that we have 16 dimensions, we have an epsilon of 0 0.01 and our uh, Lipschitz constant is, is exactly one. Yeah? And then we need about 1.5 shit tons of evaluations. So there a lot of evaluations are needed because of this exponential growth. Okay. And as a consequence, in the general case, Non-convex functions cannot be optimized efficiently. Uh, and we have seen here this, this, uh, this test function with the small dip as an example, where at no point we would get any useful uh, gradient information only at the location of, of this epsilon dip. Uh, and hence grid search is the best solution that is, that is available to us. And uh, hence in the general case, non-convex functions, we cannot solve them efficiently. It blows up exponentially. However, in practice, we can still often solve them by relying on some structure that is still present in the problem. So where the, where the practical problems are, are nicer than, than the worst case, than the theoretical worst case that we could be looking at. And um, there are heuristic methods that on these types of problems perform quite well in practice, but they don't have good theoretical guarantees and we can often construct synthetic examples where the performance of the heuristic methods is, is not very good. Okay, now there are some common test functions used in the literature to uh, evaluate these heuristic methods. Uh, so these are a couple of uh, non-convex functions that you can find quite often in the literature. Well, the Garland function here, this one is, is, is newish. It appeared in the last well, six to seven years. Uh, but the others, the Rosenbrock function and the Eckley function, these are, uh, the, those have been known for, for at least 50, 60 years and are example uh, non-convex uh, functions with um, that are more or less nice. Huh? So the Rosenbrock function, it's rather more nice um, and the optimum will lie somewhere, the optimum will lie somewhere over here. And the big challenge of the Rosenbrock function is that when you have ended up here in this valley, you have a, a very small gradient, and, but you still have to run along this valley with a very small gradient to find the optimizer uh, sitting over there. And uh, the big problem of the Eckley function is that it is highly non-convex and it has many, many, many local minima. Uh, so these are different types of problems in optimization that could occur. And there are these test functions designed specifically to, to suss these, these problems out. And then the Garland function here, uh, this is a, a rather special one. It looks quite nice, uh, the way the Garland function is designed, but it is particularly nasty because it is not Lipschitz continuous. So uh, for any, uh, you cannot find a Lipschitz constant 
uh, or the Lipschitz constant will always tend to, to towards infinity. Yeah, and so uh, this is also a, a test function used particularly now for uh, so-called optimistic optimization methods. Um, and well, you, you can imagine the, 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 the difficulties uh, that the, the gradient-based optimization uh, would have in, 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 in any of these cases. Okay. Now let's have a look at one of the first heuristic methods and uh, so there have been many heuristic methods in the past but we will uh, specifically pick that one out because it is rather easy and also rather successful. And for most programming languages you can just pull out libraries uh, that implement this differential evolution algorithm and for many practical problems in low dimensions um, the, the differential evolution algorithm uh, might already suffice for you to solve your problem. Um, maybe solve it once but maybe not consistently if you want to deploy a system that has to do the optimization at runtime over and over because it might run into problems there you have very little theoretical guarantees. Uh, but if it's enough on your problem, then maybe you can already solve your problem without thinking too much about, about optimization. So differential evolution is a type of genetic algorithm and genetic algorithm, this is an entire field that has its own scientific conferences and journals and so on. And um, uh, so this is just now an example for, 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 for this entire field. And uh, genetic algorithms are a nature inspired heuristics. And it works a little bit like evolution does in nature, where you have a survival of the fittest and uh, good results have a higher probability of uh, well, having offspring and, um, and uh, then it, the, there, there's a mixing and um, you create new variations and uh, have this evolutionary method where back bad solutions are weeded out and good solutions are able to continue to, 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 to have offspring. Okay, so differential evolution, it could already work nicely um, for functions that have only a few non-continuities or so with jumps and have rather low dimensionality and also for this differential evolution, uh, you typically require box constraints so that you have uh, an area that is like a high dimensional box um, and you don't have very fancy uh, constraints uh, on your, on your uh, domain that, that defines your function. And what you do is you populate this, uh, this range uh, initially with possibly thousands of trial solutions that are selected randomly and then you start combining them. Yeah? So then you take three random solutions from this initial population, um, let's call them X, Y, and Z, and you combine them into a new mutant by, by this formula where you combine, where you integrate all these uh, three solutions into, into a new trial solution. And uh, you check that if this is an improvement, and if yes, then you replace the X by the new mutation or new mutant V. And then you repeat that. You repeat that over and over and uh, um, um, oftentimes it happens that you terminate because all your solutions end up at the exact same spot. And because you have initially so many randomly distributed solutions, um, there is like an exploration of the solution space and areas that, have, that are better. There the, the mutants tend to survive longer and then there's like a convergence slowly to, 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 to the um, one of the optima. Okay, and also for Julia, um, there is an uh, implementation readily available and you just put in your optimization function and the box uh, constraints and uh, you don't need to have any gradient information or Hessian or, or, and so on. So uh, this can even be quite fast um, in if, if the, because the initial function evaluations are, are, are uh, not blowing up with respect to the dimensionality like the Hessian would. Okay, and now in the Adobe Reader, you could also uh, here click on the uh, play button and have a look at this animation for the differential evolution algorithm on the Eccli function that we have introduced on, on the previous slide. Okay, 
Now let's have a look at another algorithm that uses this information about the Lipschitz constant. Now consider that uh, we have a Lipschitz constant, so a maximum bendiness of our function that is known ahead of time. And uh, what we now can do is we can form lower bounds for our function. So on this picture, on the left hand side, um, the, the blue line is the non-convex function that we want to optimize. And we have made, initially we have made two evaluations of our function and these are the red dots here. So we know that at these places, and this is a one-dimensional function, so at, in these places our function uh, to how much it evaluates. And then by taking the Lipschitz constant into account, we can find a lower bound going down from these, uh, from these uh, evaluations. Uh, because, well, from the Lipschitz constant, we know that all the solutions have to lie above this, uh, this, uh, this green um, line that we have drawn. Huh? So all these yellow, yellow points are still potentially solutions, uh, but we know that there are no solutions below this, um, this, this, these green lines. And then what we do is, since we want to minimize, is uh, by just geometric considerations, we look at um, where the lowest point is, and then the next evaluation, we probably would select this point uh, and say, okay, this is potentially still the lowest possible solution. We would get an, a new evaluation point uh, that is then up here. Then we have to redraw our uh, Lipschitz bounds and then probably the next evaluation would be here. We select this point because we it from the lower bound, it could be um, the, the best solution that is still available. And then we get a next evaluation up here. And so this continues. Okay. And this works incredibly well in 1D and it works less and less well in higher dimensions uh, because you get more and more um, well, possible intersections of these uh, Lipschitzian lower bounds. And then it gets also expensive to track uh, all the different regions uh, that have been opened up and so on. Uh, but in general, if you have a Lipschitz bound, then this could work incredibly well. Uh, however, it doesn't work on functions where you don't have a Lipschitz constant, either because it, there is none, like for the Garland function, or also because you don't know any, uh, because you wrote a complex simulator and it would be a really a pain to, to, to do a mathematical analysis of your whole simulation environment to, to somehow get a Lipschitz constant out. Uh, what you could do, you could also just estimate the Lipschitz bound and hope for the best. Well, but mm -hmm, that's, that's, that can quickly become problematic. Um, uh, but in general, this is also an approach that you could just try and see how it works out. Uh, because in many languages, the, the scientific um, libraries with code for optimization, they have such an algorithm out of the box. Okay. Now, but um, there are a couple of disadvantages that I still have to mention. Oftentimes, when you compute a theoretical Lipschitz constant, uh, the Lipschitz constant will be quite large uh, and larger than you, you would prefer and larger than is also expected from, from just looking at the bendiness of, of the function. Um, and therefore this, this grid search could, or this, this uh, Lipschitzian optimization um, could result in a rather fine-grained uh, grid search because the Lipschitz constant is very large. Then in the, here these green lines would go like this. Um, and then the distance between the red points, the distance between the evaluation points is much more important than actually having uh, here a good result on, on the target function. And in essence, you get a fine-grained grid search. Um, um, so the question now is what do, you, what do we do when we uh, don't want to use a heuristic method, but we either don't know a Lipschitz constant or uh, the Lipschitz constant by the theoretical considerations is much too large. There has been a paper in the 19th, uh, 90s from, from, from Jones et al. 
which exactly proposes that. Yeah. So Lipschitzian optimization without the Lipschitz constant. And uh, the algorithm proposed in this paper, this is called the direct algorithm, uh, this was a, a small revolution and a big change in the thinking, well, how can we do Lipschitzian type optimization if we don't know the Lipschitz constant? Uh, but, but it does work in, in, in a very particular way. So now let's not think about the individual evaluations and then the Lipschitz constant lower bounds um, going out from them. But let's think about our solution set as, uh, as disjoint unions. So initially from the box constraints, here we have, uh, we have a single box in n dimensions. And, um, and now uh, this box, it has a center point. Uh, so there's here a center point here in the middle. And in the center point, we can evaluate and, and see how good the solution is, is at this point. At this point. And uh, furthermore, this box, it has uh, what is called a radius, and uh, the radius is the, the maximum distance from the center point to any other solution in this box. Yeah? So this would be like a diagonal line uh, if we are in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a um, square uh, rectangle. Um, but uh, the rectangle doesn't have to be square and then the computation of this radius becomes a little bit more involved. But imagine that we just have a center point with an evaluated uh, uh, result and, and we have a radius. And then by looking at the Lipschitz constant and at the radius, then we can provide a lower bound for the entire region. Uh, and so here, the, the lower bound for this uh, initial entire region is, is uh, well, is initially what we think how how uh, good our function uh, can be uh, at at most. Uh, however, we don't know the Lipschitz in Lipschitz constant L. Okay, but now different from the Lipschitzian optimization on the previous slide, what we now do is we split this uh, this uh, rectangle into smaller regions. Yeah. So what we initially do is we take uh, the, uh, the solution and we split it into three regions. It could also be five, but in our case, let's say we always split into three child regions. And so now we split like this and we split like this. And now we have three child regions. And then I select one of these child regions and then I have this and this selection and so on. And uh, that way I more and more um, split my regions. And for the new regions, then I also know the center point that I'm evaluating. And I also know this radius of this, um, this new region. Okay, but the question is, how do I select the regions that I want to split? So if we, if we would know the Lipschitz constant, then it would be rather easy, uh, because then we would uh, just compute the lower bound for each of the regions and take the one with the smallest lower bound and uh, just do, do this iteratively. Uh, that works beautifully, but we still have the problem that we don't know our Lipschitz constant. Now, Let's have a look at this picture here on the right hand side. What we see here are the center points for the different regions, um, but um, not in their uh, coordinates in the actual uh, function domain. Uh, but what we have here on um, this axis is the radius of that is associated with that region. And we have here how the function evaluates for the center point. Yeah. And uh, if we would know a, Lipschitz, a particular Lipschitz constant, um, and if we were selecting, for example, this point here, then we could say, well, we know how the function evaluates and we know how big the radius is. And then I can draw here this Lipschitz. Well, let's, let's, let's pick a different one. This one is hard to draw. Um, 
let me just revert that. Now we select, we select this region. And we know where it evaluates and we also uh, know what its radius is. And then I can draw for a particular Lipschitz constant here, I can draw the line. And then I get at this location, I get the lower bound. Uh, and so this tells me for a particular Lipschitz constant, well, the region, it cannot, any point in the region cannot be better than this or cannot be smaller than this. And for another Lipschitz constant, I could draw this line like this, and then I would have here my lower bound. The problem is I don't know the Lipschitz constant. So, so, so what do I do? Well, by looking at this image, we see that some points can, uh, as things are standing right now, can never be the optimum. For example, in if the Lipschitz constant is like this, then this point is the best one. And if the Lipschitz constant is like this, then this point is the best one. And if the Lipschitz constant is like this, then this point is the best one. But there are a couple of points that are in the interior, this point, this point, and so on. And all of these these are suboptimal, um, or um, they. If I if I'm computing lower bounds, then for any Lipschitz constant, they will not have the lowest lower bound. And they could still eventually contain the best solution, but as far as things stand right now, they don't contain the lowest lower bound for any Lipschitz constant. And hence, I get here something that is akin to a to a Pareto front. So there are a couple of points that are optimal. And so for any, for, and I can, by geometric considerations, I can find them out. And so all of these points here um, that are on the like Pareto front, um, those are potential regions. And what I do is I split all of the potential regions at the same time. So I pick them out. I split all the potential regions into three or five or seven or how, how much I have initially decided uh, sub-regions and then I compute the new potential regions and then I iterate over that. And that way we can uh, use Lipschitzian optimization where we don't actually have to know the Lipschitz constant. And this also, this direct algorithm, the direct stands for dividing rectangles, is something that is provided in many packages and you can just pull that out and uh, apply it on your optimization problem and you don't need to have a derivative or a hashing.